As the sun rises on a new year, we reflect on the moments that shaped us, the challenges that tested us, and the joys that filled our hearts. In the ever-changing landscape of life, one thing has remained constant, our God. He is unchanging and steadfast. He walks with us through every stage of life. As we enter into this new year, we have the privilege of walking with the same mighty God. The same God who made a way when all else felt dark. The same God who is making an eternal home for us. His promises endure, bringing hope and light to every corner of our existence. With each sunrise, His love unfolds anew guiding us through the uncharted territories of the coming days. As we navigate the unknown, we cling to the certainty that His grace will be our compass, leading us towards a future filled with purpose and direction. We don't know what this year is going to bring, but we do know who is going before us and beside us. As we step into the new year, let us marvel at the wonders around us, let us find joy in the simple yet profound truth that our God remains the same. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for worship this morning. <clears throat> As we sing that song, it's really, it's really what we established this series on is the simple truth that that God doesn't have to make New Year's resolutions, right? He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to, when the year starts fresh in 2024, sit down and write goals for his life and say, these are the things I'm going to change, these are the things I'm going to do better at, because it's the simple truth that God has never failed and he never will. He's always stayed the same. And we've based this series on uh, the verse in, in Hebrews where it tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And although we change, we change, we fail, we mess up, we have ups, we have downs, God always remains the same. And so the fact that we come here and congregate together is based on that truth. The reason that we keep coming back here and we've kept coming back here for thousands of years as we meet together in what we call church is, is that truth that God has never changed. And we meet every single Sunday to celebrate that across the world. That's pretty awesome uh, to, to know and to realize is that there's so many other people that are meeting today like we are and celebrating and praising God uh, for, for that reason that, that he never changes and he never will. Anybody like me and you realize your attitude on life is way too dependent upon the weather. Anybody like me? Where like, there's like a rainy day and you realize that your attitude is, is too dependent on the weather. The other day I was, I was eating lunch with a couple of friends and it was rainy and cold outside. And what started out as a good conversation ended up being this like dark and gloomy conversation where we talked about like people who had passed in our lives recently and we talked about pets that had passed. And it just like got to this point in conversation where we're like, man, this conversation got really depressing really fast, right? And what, what we, what we uh, concluded was we looked out the window and we said, well, maybe this conversation has gotten so dark and gloomy and depressing because of the weather. And it dawned on me that too often in my life, my attitude on life is too dependent on the weather. And this, this morning, uh, I've titled this message, Turn the Page, Turn the Page. Here's what I believe on a deeper level some of us spiritually are up and down, kind of like the weather, unpredictable, or maybe sometimes too predictable. And our spiritual lives are much like a roller coaster, where uh, it's up and downs, it's got twists and turns. Just recently, I was in the mountains and I was uh, visiting up there. And what I realized is this, is that I love the mountains. I love looking at them. I love being in the mountains, but what I hate is riding in a car through the mountains. Anybody else like me? Like you get sick, car sick easily enough just when you're on the highway, but then you go through the mountains and there's ups and downs and there's twists and turns and everything's up and down and twists and turning within your stomach, right? And uh, maybe um, you're kind of like me where you hate the inconsistency of the roads 
And maybe today, this morning, on a spiritual level, there's many of us who are here in this sanctuary this morning who we say, maybe our spiritual lives are kind of like that. There's too many ups and downs. There's too many twists and turns. And this morning, what I want us to uh, establish this morning is that there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be twists and turns to our life. But the only thing that we can, we can continue to do is turn the page. We got to keep turning the page. I'll never forget uh, a, a time in my life where I felt that up and down spiritually. I remember there was a time in my life, uh, I was a teenager, I was, I think, seventh grade, and I went to my first camp experience, right? So we got all together, I packed my suitcase, I was so amped to go with like the older uh, uh, students in our ministry. We went middle school and high school, I was really excited, it was back in like 05, so I packed my suitcase full of like plaid shorts, right? with cargo, cargo pockets, right, the ugliest shorts. If you're wearing those today, I'm sorry. It's time to just give those to the Goodwill and get some new shorts. Um, but it wasn't just cargo shorts. It was plaid cargo shorts, right? And uh, I remember packing my suitcase full of American Eagle T-shirts and Hollister and Abercrombie. It was, that was, what, was what it was about back then. And I thought I was so cool. I was excited to go to camp. It had just gotten to the point in my life where I was like unashamedly pursuing girls, right? And um, I would tell my parents that, you know, some girls were cute. And uh, so anyway, it was at that point where uh, I was excited to go meet all the Christian honeys at church camp. Um, <laughs> but I'll never forget what happened on the last, last night of camp. You see, what I love about camps and retreats, which shameless plug, we're getting ready to take our leadership, uh, our student leadership team to uh, the mountains for our retreat. Um, camps and retreats are so beneficial to teenagers. And so if you're a parent and you're reluctant, um, give your students those experiences. Get them out of their uh, environment and let them learn about Jesus in a way uh, that's geared for them and they're with their friends experiencing God move. And so it was one of those nights right, um, where I came for all the wrong reasons, but at that point in, in, in that week, I saw God start to move. I saw um, students that I really looked up to, athletes that were juniors and seniors in high school, and I saw them on their knees, and I saw them worshiping God. I saw God move unlike, at, at that point, unlike any time that I had ever seen before, and um, I remember how defining it was for me in my life to see God move in that way. And so I started to lift my hands in worship as I watched them and I watched God move in their lives. I knew that God was present in that room. And at that moment of surrender in my life, I, 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 I was shook. I can't really put it into words, but maybe you've had an experience like that in your faith journey where it was the first time you really surrendered to everything. And you said, this is, this is the only thing that matters. And so I lifted my hands and I worshiped and um, I started to learn about God in that moment. I started to learn about his call for my life. I would say that that was kind of the start of my journey as a minister. I realized that God was shaping and defining me as I surrendered my life to him. And I remember promising to God in that moment that I was never going back to an empty praise. And I remember we got back and we got back into church just the very next week. And all my friends, I looked around, they were kind of talking with each other. They weren't involved or engaged in worship. And I remember for the first time feeling like I have a choice to make here, whether to be fake or whether to be real. And whether to, to fulfill the promise that I gave God or whether to just be like all my friends and fit in. And uh, I remember I didn't lift my hands in worship because it didn't seem it didn't seem as engaging as it was at camp with all the lights and all the loud music. We were in Louisville, Kentucky, and we would open up a hymnal. And it was very different than the worship that we had at camp. And I remember feeling like such a fake. I remember feeling like I had just promised God something, and I, then I just let him down with an empty praise. And I remember my dad getting up to preach, and he preached that morning on being set apart and being different. And I felt the Holy Spirit convict me unlike any other moment of my life. And I remember at the end when he offered up the altar to come and, and, and spend time with Jesus, I ran to the altar and I got down on my knees and I prayed 
And um, Jody's dad, we called him Coach. I'll never forget it. He comes to me, and he could see that something was bothering him, and he prays with me. And I told him that I had made a decision to, to unashamedly worship Jesus, and I had failed him that morning. And he told me, he lifted me up, stood me up, and said, son, this is going to be a daily surrender for your life. It's not a one-time thing. It's a daily surrender. And I remember he took out a card and he wrote my name on it and said, and, and he said, Trace Reese, he rededicated his life again on this day. And I remember how those words, it's a daily surrender. It kind of shaped my life ever since. And I realized that, that we're, we're going to fail, but we serve a God who never does. And the only thing that we can control is our surrender day in and day out. There's a story in the Bible that's very similar to the story I just told you about my life, um, and it is the, the life of, of Peter. Um, maybe if you're here this morning and you've been here the past several years, you, you, might, you might be like, every time Trey gets up to speak, he speaks about Peter, right? Peter is my favorite character in the Bible. Um, I, I have like four different messages that I love preaching um, but this is kind of a new one, um, and so uh, I'm, I'm preaching this morning uh, about turning the page. We're going to talk about Peter's lives, the ups and downs, and as I just mentioned, it's very similar to the story I just told you in my life. So we're going to focus in on specifically five pages of scripture, but before we get there, we need to do a little recap of Peter's life up until this point. Peter and his brothers, uh, this is the very beginning of what we get of Peter's life in scripture. Peter and his brothers are out fishing and that's because they were professional fishermen. They didn't do it as a hobby like I do it, but they were actually professional fishermen. They hadn't caught anything all night or all morning. And Jesus walks up, maybe you guys know this story, Jesus walks up and he tells them to go deeper and to cast their nets on the other side, right? And at that point, the fish jump into their nets. They had had no success up until this point. Jesus walks up, tells them to go deeper, cast their nets to the other side. They're like, why not? Right? We failed up until this point. So they cast their nets on the other side. And the, the Bible says that their nets were breaking because they had caught so much fish. And so at that point, Jesus tells Peter, come and follow me. And Peter's like, sure, this dude who has no idea about fishing just told me to do something and fish jumped into my nets. He sounds like a pretty powerful guy. I'll follow him. And so Peter follows Jesus. And scripture tells us that Jesus at that point tells Peter, you're no longer going to be a fisher of fish. You're going, to be fish. you're going to be a fisher of men, right? You guys familiar with that story, right? And so Peter starts to follow Jesus. Jesus starts his ministry. And one night after Jesus talked to all the people, Jesus told the disciples to go get the boat and go to the other side. And after Jesus dismissed the crowd, Jesus does this a lot in Scripture. He goes up and he secludes himself from the cloud from the crowd and spends time alone with the Father in prayer. And so this is one of those moments. He tells the disciples to go get the boat, go to the other side. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, as he was up on the mountain, all of a sudden what happens is, is there's a storm. We kind of learned a little bit about this last week. There was a storm that took place, and the disciples are freaking out because they're kind of inconsistent too, just like I am. Their attitude was too dependent on the weather. So they're freaking out when a storm happens. Right? Jesus comes down, and he starts walking on water. You guys know that story? And so what happens is, Peter's like, that's awesome, right? I want to do that too. And so Peter steps out, takes a few steps, and he's looking at Jesus, takes his focus off of Jesus, and he puts it on the waves, and Peter starts to sink. Then a few pages over, again, Peter confesses Jesus as Christ the Messiah. And Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, on that confession, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. And uh, we know that, that Peter was actually, the, the name Peter was actually given to Jesus, or given by Jesus to Peter, and Peter means rock, right? And, um, and so Jesus says at this moment, on this rock, I will build my church. So he gives purpose to Peter in this moment. Then um, uh, one night before Jesus' arrest, Jesus just casually mentions in a dinner that one of his disciples will betray him, right? So they're sitting there, they're having dinner, 
They're, they've been friends for a few years, right? And uh, they're having dinner as close friends would. And Jesus is like, I hate to like ruin a good time, but like one of you guys are fake. One of you guys are going to completely betray me. And so they all start to kind of argue. And Peter he, he mans up and, he's, and he tells Jesus, I will never betray you. And, and, and he even goes further and says, I'll give my life for you. And Jesus kind of like calms him down. And he says, Peter, chill out. Like before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times which I always thought was like a weird reference of time, right? Like, why did Jesus say before the rooster crows? Like, he could have said anything, like before midnight on this day, but he says, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, right? And so we read scripture, and, and that's where we'll really we'll pick up. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and pick up. Peter denies Jesus three times in this passage. John chapter 18, verses 10 through 11 says this, and this is at Jesus' arrest, okay, so this is before his denial, sorry. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servants and cut off his right ear. So this is where I'm telling you, like, Peter is extremely passionate. And so at this point in Peter's life, he is moved with outrageous faith. He's at a point in his life kind of like where I was in my camp experience when I was a middle schooler and kind of like where I am continually when we meet on Sunday mornings and maybe even Wednesday nights where you, you come into God's presence, you're f full of faith. Peter is here at this moment in his life. That's where he's at in his faith journey. He's full of faith. And he pulls out a sword, which again is weird to me and why I think I can relate to Peter. Why does Peter even have a sword, right? Right? Peter is a fisherman. He should not have like a full on shore, but a sword, but the Bible says that he pulls his sword out of his sheath. And I think that, that Peter is maybe going through an obsessive season. Anybody like me, you have like obsessive seasons. And maybe like Peter was trying to be something that he's not. Like for me, sometimes like I go through seasons of life and people make fun of me about this. They say, what version of Trey am I getting, right? Um, uh, I go through... I go through seasons where I get obsessed. And it, like if I, if I pick up a hobby, I'm going full in, right? I'm not like going half-heartedly. I'm doing it full-heartedly. I'm getting all the gear. And so Peter, I don't know if he's trying to be a pirate or a soldier, but he's got a sword and he, it's in his sheath. He takes it out and the Bible says he cuts off the soldier's ear, right? And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me. And so again, at this point, Peter was so moved with faith, he pulled out a full-on sword and cut off a dude's ear. And some of y'all are right here with Peter this morning. You're full of an incredible amount of faith, and you would even in this moment risk your life for Jesus as Peter just did. But the question is not whether you're, you're full of faith right here on a Sunday morning. Because maybe in years past, you've realized that it's your, your, the decisions you make on a Sunday morning isn't really what defines your life. The question really is what's on your next page? And as we turn the page, turn the page with me, we'll see what's on Peter's next page. So turn with me to, to verse 15 through 18. It says this, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple since that disciple was known to the high priest. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And Peter said, I am not. So now the servants and officers who made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves, Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. And then just a few verses over, verse 25 through 27, we see the other two times Peter denies Jesus. It says this, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And again, he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. And so as we turn the page on Peter's life where he's moved from outrageous faith, 
We turn the page, and Peter's next page was a lousy faith, one where he denied Jesus three times in one night. So here Peter is. He's ashamed, probably. Jesus has been taken away, and um, at this point, you know, the next part of Peter's life, Jesus had already been crucified. He had been buried. So he's, he's got no Jesus. He's not following after Jesus. He thinks that he has no purpose in his life. He thinks that there's no way that he can do anything worthwhile because of his failure already up until this point. And he's probably asking himself, what am I supposed to do now? Where do I go from here? And so Peter does what any respectable man would do as he's dealing with turmoil and uncertainty and hopelessness. He grabs his fishing rod and he goes fishing, right? So he picks up his fishing pole. That was kind of a joke. I was saying that's what I do whenever I have hopelessness. Go spend time. Go fish. <clears throat> so he picks up his fishing pole. He goes fishing. And Jesus meets him again at the shore where some of the disciples are fishing. And Jesus tells them again to cast their nets on the other side. And the nets were breaking due to how many fish they caught. All right, so this is what's on the next page of Peter's story. Turn the page again. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to them, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, how many times? Three, Three times. Third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And so Jesus pulls Peter aside and asks him three times, do you love me? And there's many different theories on this, why Jesus asked him three times. But I think the, the most consistent one is the simple truth is that, that Jesus is telling Peter, I can handle your three mess-ups. I forgive you. Which leads us to a truth this morning that I want all of us to hear, no matter where you find yourself this week as you come in through these doors on a Sunday morning, whether you've had a great week and you feel like you are living a, a Christ-first life and you're doing well, you're devoted, you're a fully devoted follower of Jesus this past week, or whether you feel like a complete failure Here's the truth I want us to hear this morning is, is this, is that Jesus can handle our slip-ups. Jesus can handle your slip-ups. You see, Jesus comes into Peter's life. At this point, Peter had just denied Jesus. Peter probably feels like he completely let down Jesus and that Jesus wants nothing to do with Peter at all. And, P and Jesus calls Peter and he says, hey, come spend a little time with me. Eat your, eat your breakfast and then I want to I just talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. And Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says again, do you love me? You know that I love you. Jesus asks again, do you love me? And Peter says, you know all things. You know that I love you. And after each time Peter confesses that he loves Jesus, what does Jesus say to him? He says, feed my sheep. And so what Jesus is doing is he's reinstating the purpose, the promise that he had already given Peter's life when Jesus came into his life before and said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And he also said, I'm going to build my church on this confession, on this rock. And in this moment, Peter thinks he is completely disqualified from serving Jesus. And Jesus reinstates his purpose and says, my purpose that I promised you for your life is not dependent upon your success. It's dependent upon your obedience and your surrender. And in this moment, Jesus reinstates Peter and turn the page with me. It gets better and better from here on out. <clears throat> Next page, Jesus is ascending into heaven. This is Acts chapter 1. Jesus is ascending into heaven. And so Peter, again, with all the disciples, are left wondering what is next for their life. They're, st they're staring up. The Bible says that they're, they stopped and they stared at Jesus ascending into heaven. And 
it, the Bible says that they, they were standing there for so long that an angel had to appear in a white robe telling them what their mission was after Jesus had already told them what their mission was. He says, why do you stand here staring at heaven? Go do what Jesus told you to do. And what did Jesus t- tell them to do? He told them to go into the upper room and wait on the Holy Spirit so that they could fulfill the great commission which he had already given to them. And so the disciples at this point They're standing there staring, and then the angel appears, tells them to go to the upper room, and if you will, turn the page. Then the the day of Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit comes rushing in. All of the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. Turn the next page, and you'll see Peter, who who had just considered himself a failure, gets up in front of a crowd of people. This is Acts chapter 2, and he delivers a message. He preaches. He bears witness to what Jesus had taught him up until this point, all the things that Jesus has done. He he says, Jesus died for your sins. And then he rose again and he appeared to us for 40 days. And then he ascended into heaven. And I'm telling you that you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because people fail, God never fails. And he's preaching this message. And the Bible says that he was so filled with the Holy Spirit uh, at that moment that the Bible says that 3,000 people were added to the number that day. And so I want you to get this. The, at this point, Jesus had walked for three years with the disciples. He was doing ministry to all the earth. He was healing. He was teaching. He was doing something great. But guess what? The number of followers of Jesus at this point was only 30. It was about 30 is what we, what we guesstimate. 30 followers of Jesus. But Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, gets up, preaches, and the Bible says 3,000 people were added to the number that day. What the Holy Spirit did through Peter was multiplied the number of believers by 100 that day. It went from 30 to 3,000 because Jesus, time and time again, showed up in Peter's life even when he messed up. And what Peter did consistently was he kept turning the pages. His life was up and down. He had moments where he was filled with incredible faith. And here's what I want us to get this morning. In just about five short pages, we see that Peter's life goes from ninja faith where he pulls out his sword, chops off the dude's ear. Next page, lousy faith. He's denying Jesus. Then the next page, he's filled with the Spirit. Next page, he gets up. And he preaches in front of people, and the number goes from 30 to 3,000. This all happens in a matter of just five short pages. So in in, in, in roughly, it's, it's, it's five short pages, but roughly it's about two months of Peter's life. And I want you to think about yourself this morning as we're just midway through, or a little bit more than middle of the way through January. All these resolutions that you came up with. In just about 21 days, you've probably already failed numerous times. In just about two months of Peter's life, he's gone through different seasons of his faith, where he was up high, right? He was on a mountaintop. He felt like he was moved by faith to complete disappointment, complete failure, all in a matter of about 50, 60 days. And maybe for you in 21 days, you've seen the same is true, that there's ups and downs, which leads me to my two points and my two only points this morning. Number one is this. There's two unavoidable truths. As we look at Peter's life, we see this. Two unavoidable truths is this. Number one, the infallibility of God. God cannot fail. God, time and time again, is faithful to show up in our lives. God is is completely holy. He never fails. We sing about it this morning. He won't fail. He won't fail. Although we fail, and although the, the, the rain fell, and, 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 and the winds blew, God remained true. He was always faithful. And we can put our trust in him because he never fails. And let's think about that in Peter's life. So Jesus, again, comes to Peter, he tells him, I've got new purpose for your life, you're going to be a fisher of men. Then later he says, I'm going to build my my church on this confession. And at that point, Jesus had already given Peter purpose. 
And Peter thought, there's no way Jesus can do anything with me, but Jesus reinstates him because Jesus can't fail. When he promises us something, we can take it to the bank because he, he won't fail. He won't fail on his promise. And so my question to us this morning is, what has he promised you? He promised Peter that he was going to be a fisher of men. He promised Peter that he was going to build his church on that rock. What has he promised you? Well, here's one thing that he's promised all of us, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. No matter how many times we fail, no matter how many times we mess up, he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. What else has he promised you? He's promised us and given us purpose in, in the way that, that, that he is he has called us to be a holy and blameless people because of what Jesus did on the cross. That he, he tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We can take it to the bank. And maybe sometimes through the ups and downs of our weeks and through the ups and downs of the seasons of life that we're in, we fail and we mess up and we say, there's no way that I'm holy and blameless before the Lord right now. But what we have to take to the bank is that he already promised us that. He's already promised that Jesus' shed blood on that cross was enough for us. So we don't have to live in our own righteousness because Jesus' righteousness was enough. And we get imputed into us his righteousness because of our faith in him and because of his grace in our lives. And so the, the, what is true this morning is that Jesus can handle your mess ups and he is completely holy. He's never failed. He is infallible. And because of that, all the promises in scripture are based on the fact that he is infallible and number two, that we are fallible, the fallibility of man. When Jesus promised us those things, he knew that we were gonna fail. When Jesus came into Peter's life and he said, you're gonna be a fisherman on this rock, I'm gonna build my church, he knew that Peter was gonna fail. And when Jesus reinstated Peter and told him his purpose, he did so in knowing that he had already failed. And so the, the, the bottom line here this morning, guys, is this. The bottom line is this. We got to keep turning the page. And as I wrap up this morning, our worship team can, can go ahead and, and come forward. <clears throat> I'll wrap up with this illustration. This is a moment of honesty from me to you, right? This is, this is a bad dad moment, okay? So every night, uh, my, my daughter, she, she, I put her to bed. Almost every night. Shouldn't say every night. I put her to bed, and she asked me to read her a story. And maybe if you're like me, you know, and you got young kids, and they ask you to, to read them a story at night, and they want you to read them a book, what you do is you go for the shortest book on the bookshelf, right? <laughs> and you say, I'm going to pick the one that's like five pages, because I got a lot to do tonight, right? The night is still young. I still have things that I got to do, right? And I got things that I got to take care of. And I got to get prepared for tomorrow. So I can't spend a whole lot of time reading this book. And so I go get the shortest book on the bookshelf. And I'll read those five pages. Boom. Done deal. Right? And uh, what I got in the habit of is, you know, I would go grab that short book. And, and second goes, I don't want to read that same book again. Right? And so she, I say, well, what book do you want to read? I'll read you whatever book you want. That was, that was not a good idea. Right? <laughs> so she grabs one of the largest books on the bookshelf. And so I'm like, all right, no big deal. I got this, right? I got this. So I open up the book. You know, it's a, it's a large book. And what I did in a bad dad moment, again, I'm, I'm being honest with you, okay? Don't judge me here this morning, is I open up the first page, read the first page, read the second page, yeah. <laughs> read the second to last page, read the last page, right? And I got in the habit of doing that, and, and as Sutton got older, you know, as, as she got a, a little bit more learned, right, she realized that I was skipping, skipping chapters in the book. And she's like, hold up, this book is not making any sense. How did the princess, I'm just kind of making this up, how did the princess go from the tower to where she was kissing a frog, right? This, this book does not make sense at all, Right? And what I learned is, is that as she got older, her attention span got greater. And because her attention span got greater, she wanted me to read all the pages of the book. And as she learned that the book doesn't make sense when you just skip chapter after chapter. It doesn't make sense when you skip 
a whole, the, all the middle of the book and only read the first and the last pe- couple pages. And so what I had to start doing was I had to start reading the, the, the entire book. And what I learned in those moments is that when I spend time reading with her, it's the most valuable time in the world, not just to her, but to me. And when I spend time flipping those pages, I'm spending valuable time with my daughter. And here's what I want us to learn this morning, that our lives aren't gonna make sense when we just open up the first page, when we come on Sunday mornings, and then we skip a whole week worth of chapters and say, okay, that Sunday morning was awesome, next Sunday morning. But here's the reality for us this morning, is that we are gonna fail, we're gonna mess up, But like Peter, we need to be faithful to turn the page and to say, yeah, I'm going to fail, but what's next? Yeah, I'm going to fail today and probably tomorrow, but what's next? What does God have next for me? And as we talk about New Year, same God, here's the reality. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is infallible. And although we may change some here and there, what is consistent with, within us is that we are fallible. We mess up. So for us to come on a Sunday morning and say, all right, got a great word. I'm going to get my life in order. going to make a New Year's resolution. I'm going to be perfect. That would be a plan to fail because we fail. But for us to come here and we worship and us to make a New Year's resolution to where we say, in 2024, I'm going to be more disciplined and I'm going to be more committed to discipline rather than perfection. That would be a good plan for us to say, I'm going to be more disciplined to turn the page. I think what you'll learn is this, is that as you decide to be more disciplined to turn the page, each page of your life, you'll find that that time that you spend with your father is the most beneficial time. If you decide this morning where you say, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do these five things and, and I'll go ahead and share my list of my five disciplines. How do I turn the page? Number one, you can spend time in God's word. That's something we can all do. It's so accessible. There's parts of the world where, where God's word is not nearly as accessible as it is here. We all have it in our pockets. It's, all, it's on all of our cell phones. Most of all of us have it on our bookshelves. If you're like me, you probably got like 20 Bibles, right? You want to have a Bible anywhere and anywhere, right? Everywhere and anywhere. One, spend time in his word. Turn the page literally in scripture, day in, day out, turn the page. Number two, another spiritual discipline you can do is spend time in God's presence, spend time in prayer. Learn how that shapes your life. Number three, you can join a U group. Join a U group. We have a wall out there. If you leave this morning, you're not committed to a U group. I think this is like such a beneficial way for you to grow in your faith. A lot of times like we kind of advertise these things as a church and maybe, you know, you've kind of come in and come out and you realize, you know, they're always pushing something on us. This is not for us. We don't, we don't, do you groups on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings so that we look better at University Church. We do it because we understand that it helps the individual in their faith when they're committed to a community of believers, amen? Amen. And so join a you group. That would be a way that you could be disciplined this year in 2024. Number four, you can serve. I've, I've seen this played out in my life. I was just having a conversation with one of my close friends and I told them, that the the thing that keeps me turning the page that doesn't allow me to get in a rut is that I give my gifts and my passions to Jesus. And I know that I've got to be not just mentally sharp, but I've got to be spiritually sharp if I'm going to lead people and I'm going to serve in some way. And so time and time again, I get right before God and I don't allow myself to get in a rut because I know that I got to preach most of the time twice or three, three times a week. Occasionally, And so what I've learned is that I've got to stay on my A game. And here's the truth for you, whether you're a pastor or whether you get up and preach, you got something that you could give to the kingdom of God and you can use your gifts and your passions 
in that way. And I think that that will help you individually grow in your faith if you start using those gifts and serving in the local church. I think that would be beneficial for you in 2024. And finally, number five, seek discipleship. We kind of started off this series with that in mind, that everyone in 2024 can either disciple somebody or be discipled by somebody. Everyone is a disciple maker. If you've chosen to walk with Jesus, he's given us all the same purpose, the same mission, that is to go therefore and make disciples. You can disciple somebody no matter where you are in your journey of faith, whether you've been coming to church for a decade or two decades or you've been here for longer than that or whether this is day one for you and you've decided to enter into a relationship with Jesus, there is disciples to be made. You have your story, you have your gifts, you have your passions, you can make a disciple. And all of us can be discipled by someone. Seek discipleship. And so those are five disciplines that we can take away this morning and be better in 2024 for the kingdom of heaven. And so with that being said, I think it's time for us to get to the maturity, kind of like my daughter got, where she realized it's not enough to just read the first couple pages and the last couple pages, but I gotta be committed to turning each page because I don't wanna skip out on anything that Jesus has for my life. We gotta get to a place, maturity speaking, in our spiritual maturity, where we decide to turn each page. And so with that being said, let's raise our glasses. We're gonna vow, we're gonna make our New Year's resolution, our toast, we can all stand up. <clears throat> you guys could say this with me. Our 2024 resolution, this year I vow to be more committed to discipline than perfection. I vow to be more committed to discipline than perfection. And I think that we'll see that 2024 will be our best year yet if we are committed to discipline rather than perfection. At this moment, we're gonna go ahead and close and, and we're gonna go ahead and uh, go into a time of, not close, but go into a time of commitment. Uh, here at University Church, we always, give you the opportunity to uh, pray with a, a pastor or you can just come up and pray by yourself. But here's what we believe. We believe that this place is a house of prayer. We believe that, that it is beneficial for you to spend time in prayer with your creator. And I've seen that time and time again in my life. I've seen the power of posture. I've seen the power of when I step out and my surrender and I get on my knees before God, I see him come and move in my life unlike any other times uh, uh, of just casual prayer. But to, to spend time in intentional prayer is when God really gets a hold of your heart. And so if you feel led to come and spend time in prayer this morning after we, look, after we have looked at God's word, uh, make sure you do that. Go ahead and bow with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it goes forth, Lord, that as we look at Peter's life and as we look at um, just his, his character, Lord, his ups and downs and and Lord, as we see that time and time again, you show up and uh, you show us in scripture that, that you can use people who fail as long as you have their surrender. Lord, I pray that that would call us uh, and, and draw us into further surrender and uh, to be more disciplined followers of you. Lord, I pray whatever it is uh, that you're calling us to do, Lord, I pray that you would give us the help from your Holy Spirit um, to, to do those things. In your name we pray, amen.